Good morning, Bitcoiners. Hello and welcome back to another edition of your Bitcoin economic calendar, the news and analysis you need to start the week off right in Bitcoin. Today is Monday, May 10th, and in today's episode, we have a lot of insights from our research that we want to share. Um, first off, we're going to start talking about the US dollar index, which has broken down price-wise from a critical support level. And we're going to discuss what that may mean medium and long term and what the implications could be for Bitcoin. We're also going to talk about Ethereum, uh, whose price is up 133% in the last 35 days. And last but certainly not least, we spent a lot of time talking about inflationary pressures in this episode or in this show. And today we're going to be spending some time to discuss deflationary pressures in the economy and how those may be playing out in the next year or two. So big episode today. Grab your coffees. On to our analysis. Starting as we usually do with Bitcoin, we see that last night's close on Sunday evening um, was a contested one and it ended up closing the week at $58,305, up 2.97%. Um, if we zoom in a little bit here and you see this, this line here, uh, the close of last night was actually just above the very critical level of $57,500, which is this line that you see here. And interestingly, again, as we see from this line, um, Bitcoin has been in this range for almost 12 weeks now, just over 12 weeks now. So if we compare this consolidation stage with or this price action with the price action from previous market cycles, and I'm going to pull that up behind your screen right now. Um, we see here that this accumulation period actually is a common uh, trend amongst Bitcoin bull market cycles. And um, if we look at the 2017 cycle, we see that this consolidation stage lasted 55 days. If we look at the 2013 cycle, we see that overall it lasted 197 days. And um, the consolidation around the 57,500 level, as you can see here, has now been going on for 84 days so far this cycle. Now, to talk about the potential headwinds for uh, yeah, potential headwinds for Bitcoin. Um, it could have been impacted by Biden's capital gains tax proposal. Now, why is this the case? As tax laws are not typically retroactive, so uh, essentially when a government passes a new tax law, it, it basically comes into effect for the next tax year. Very rarely does it come into effect for the current tax year. Um, for that reason, um, it's... it's um, it's likely that some investors may have jumped the gun to realize some of these uh, tax gains ahead of the potential change that may be coming in for next year. So this type of dynamic um, would have impacted typically the best performing assets in the portfolio. So Bitcoin and um, Kay uh, Kathy Wood from ARK Invest also mentions that this same dynamic has hurt innovation strategies in general. Uh, again, because they've been performing so well leading up to that announcement. Um, we'll discuss that po the possibility of this new tax framework actually coming into effect in our What's Ahead section later today. Now, as a potential tailwind for Bitcoin, as we discussed in the, um, in the opening, let's take a look at the dollar index. So as we see uh, from this line here, the dollar index has now essentially broken down a key uh, trend line and a key support in this key trend line. And it's starting to display like this, this type action right now, this, this rising trend line and, and breaking further lower is actually something that it is, um, it's typically displayed in the dollar index in these site, uh, in these um, really large, down cycles. So for example, what do we mean by this? Let's take a quick look here. Um, you see here, for example, in this, uh, in this um, part of the cycle right here between 2017, so this was around September 2017, we see that when the dollar index actually breaks down from this sort of rising support in the middle of a downtrend, it typically leads to a, to a, sub a significant or substantial further leg down. Um, the pattern that we're seeing in this, uh, in the current formation, I guess the one that's been happening from December this year until now, again, it seems to have some semblance to the one that was forming between August and December 2017. 
So there is a possibility that this that the index continues uh, to seek lower and lower price levels, potentially bringing it down to that 88 uh, number, which is a key another key support level. But essentially, this uh, could be a tailwind for Bitcoin because as we've covered here, dollar weakness tends to be a positive uh, uh, a positive uh, uh, driver for prices of Bitcoin and equities in general. The other thing to consider is that with unemployment and inflation rates in the U.S. still very far away from the Fed's targets, it's looking increasingly likely that the dollar will continue to move lower. Again, this is typically a positive catalyst for Bitcoin. Now, um, let's take a quick peek uh, at the signs of institutional activity in Bitcoin because those are continuing to mount and uh, as an example, what we wanted to show here was the difference between the Bitcoin futures annual annualized rolling three months basis. And what we are going to draw your attention to here is the difference between the CME and other platforms. So actually, let's pop the CME and Binance. This is the CME versus Binance. So as we see from, from this chart here, we can see that the difference between the uh, basis in the CME and Binance used to be around 10%, it actually quite often under 10%. What we're starting to see as of recently is that that gap is now shooting up to about 20%. Uh, if we look at here, you know, 25% on, on Binance or 27% on Binance and 7% at the CME, uh, and another very interesting thing to note is that for a brief period here, we are starting to see that the uh, basis pre the basis implied on the CME premium is actually sub 5%. What does this mean? It means that institutions are coming in and participating in the CME futures market, not so much in the other futures markets or the unregulated venues. Um, what this is another sign of is that the institutions are essentially in Bitcoin markets but they're in Bitcoin markets to take advantage of dislocations in these types of future versus spot. Uh, they're not necessarily just long Bitcoin. They are in to arb out all the inefficiencies that they see in the market. Uh, so again, another very interesting trend to keep our eyes on. Moving over to the S&P 500, we see that last week the S&P 500 closed at a fresh new all-time high of 4,234 points up 1.07 percent for the week now interestingly in the equity markets we're seeing that the sector rotation from technology into industrials is in full swing and that's evidenced by not just the s p having a great week but let's take a look at the dow jones the dow jones is just soaring right now last week it had a pretty significant breakout again to a new all-time high of up 2.67 percent for the week and during the same week, we see the NASDAQ, again, down 1.02% for the week, uh, closing at 13,719 points. So industrials higher, technology lower. Uh, further evidence of this shift at play is what is happening with copper and lumber prices. So if we um, take a look at the headline behind right now, uh, it, it, you know, headlines like this are abound in the media, which says bets on economic rebound push copper prices to record highs. Uh, that's copper breaking out of a 24 year high. And if we look at lumber for a second, lumber prices are just uh, skyrocketing. Um, they have actually almost tripled. Uh, lumber prices have almost tripled since their pre-pandemic levels. Uh, so again, you know, if if we look at pre-pandemic levels, we were sub uh, $400, around $400. Now lumber is at $1,700, which uh, is a quite impressive. And again, continue signs of industrial activity um, that, that are in the economy. Coppers, copper and lumber are both uh, great sort of uh, indicators of construction activity and industrial activity in general. Now, um, we've been talking quite a bit here about the Russell 2000 index, which again, it, it tracks the smallest capitalization companies in the um, in US equities. 
And um, this is interesting because it speaks to the breadth of the rally. So it's not just industrials or technology. It's also small caps in general. And uh, as we've mentioned, Tom Lee, the analyst at Fundstrat, is looking for a breakout out of the 2293 level, which we haven't been able to crystallize in this. Now, we see that the, the um, weekly candles continue to be within this compression and accumulation uh, range that we defined, uh, I think, two weeks ago. But they still continue to actually be here. This morning, we see a slight break off of this, uh, off of this pattern. And it does look like it's continuing to coil up for a decisive move in either direction. Now, bringing it back to the S&P 500, and again, talking about what we can expect this week, earnings season is starting to wind down, but we still have some meaningful reports this week with Alibaba, Airbnb, and DoorDash all reporting on Tuesday. There are also Federal Reserve governor speeches on Tuesday at 9 a.m. and on Thursday at 1 p.m. So again, Keep those in mind as they tend to move the markets uh, if, anything, uh, if, if anything of relevance is said. Uh, again, everyone's paying a lot of attention to the Fed right now. Moving over to gold, although we haven't had anything exciting to share on this side um, for quite some time, we're starting to see some signs of life in gold on the back of that breakdown in the dollar index. So last week, as you can see here, gold had its biggest weekly gain of 2021, closing the week up 3.53% at $1,831 per ounce. Uh, the weekly close is also very significant from a technical point of view. So as you can see from the chart behind your screen, that weekly close actually breaks away from the downtrend or that down channel that gold has had from essentially August 2020, the beginning of August 2020. Now, um, when these types of very long-term directional channels break, they typically continue to run on momentum. We're, we're starting to see some signs of that potential continuation in this morning's price action. Uh, this could also mean, as we've covered here, that um, as we know, gold is inversely correlated to the real returns of U.S. Treasuries. So that would also be consistent with treasury interest rates being flat for almost two months now. Let's take a look at the yield on the ten, uh, at the yield on the ten-year note again, flat to down. And um, as these rates, uh, interest rates on these bonds continue to flatline or go lower, and inflation indicators everywhere continue to run higher. Uh, again, this is consistent with that idea of real returns coming down and gold potentially going up. Uh, and this trend may continue in the near term. So something to keep paying attention to. Moving over to our DeFi commentary, we see that it's been all green for DeFi and Ethereum lately. Both saw fresh new all-time highs last week. Uh, the DeFi index closed higher by 4.39% at 15,351 points. Ethereum, on its hand, uh, was up 33.07%, closing the week at $3,928. So uh, if we look at Ethereum prices over the last six weeks, and uh, we just run a quick bar here just to measure, uh, this is a little bit higher already from yesterday. Uh, but we see here that over the last 35 days, really, Ethereum is up 133%. Uh, that's quite impressive. And um, elsewhere in DeFi and Ethereum land, we see reports now that DeFi is a hundred billion dollar sector. Um, our view is that this type of price action could still be a tailwind effect on that European Union bond offering on the Ethereum blockchain that we saw last week, as well as the growth in DeFi. Um, this trend, uh, as evidenced by the price action, seems to be picking up steam rather than slowing down. Um, lastly, in altcoin land, we had an interesting event uh, with Dogecoin and, and Elon Musk essentially hosting SNL last week and lots of expectations that he would be talking about Dogecoin. Um, somewhat to be expected, we see that Dogecoin started selling off after Elon Musk's performance and was down 25% uh, actually the day after the show. It does seem to have been quickly recovering, but again, that recovery has faded very quickly. Um, we believe that this type of price action is driven by the quick emergence 
of derivative markets around Dogecoin and the ability to short Dogecoin, which again, many people would likely doing, uh, looking to do um, with so many people heavily short uh, and the price being so volatile, it is likely that we'll, we'll see a lot of these knee-jerk price moves as the hype unwinds. So be very careful out there. Moving over to our Bitcoin mining difficulty commentary, we see that the next difficulty adjustment is scheduled to kick in on Wednesday, and it's currently projected to bring difficulty back up around 12% to about 23.13 terahashes. Now, we see that the mempool congestion in the back of your screen has come down dramatically, and so have transaction costs. Transaction fees have now are now down to about 70 sats per vbyte as of last night. Um, let's take a look at where they are right now. They're about 88 sats per vbyte this morning, uh, and uh, as of last night, uh, last night we were confirming two sats per byte confirmation on the two block time frame. Right now, to get it into that second block, it's still about 74, like between 60 and 74 sats per V byte. So again, uh, just to put it in perspective, we were at uh, north of 250 sats per V byte for next block confirmations last week. So this has all come down quite dramatically. And again, just to look at how the network has unclogged. The, the way that the Bitcoin network self-regulates itself through difficulty adjustments is it's really awe-inspiring. Now, as always, we leave you with what's ahead for the week. Last Friday, we got less than stellar employment updates out of the U.S., with April, April numbers being way below analysts' expectations, as you can see in the article behind you. Analysts were expecting an increase of over 1 million new jobs in the non-farm payroll numbers, and the results came in at just a pickup of 266,000. Uh, that's about 25% of what was expected. And April was also the month during which the last stimulus checks were announced and deployed. At a high level, this could be interpreted as people who are being paid not to work, not working. Um, what else does this mean? This also means that the Fed can't lift the foot off the pedal just yet. And hence, we saw all markets rally on Friday after that jobs number came out. Biden's plans to pay for his infrastructure stimulus package, uh, his, he actually plans to pay for this stimulus package through a series of higher taxes. The biggest headwind for markets is the proposed increase in the capital gains taxes from 22.8% to 41%. There are also proposed increases to the tax income, the highest tax income bracket and bringing that up to 41%. And lastly, there's a proposal to bring up the corporate rate from 21% to 28%. Uh, again, Kathy Wood, or Kathy Wood from ARK Invest believes that the capital gain taxes have a low probability of passing given that the Democratic Party has a razor thin majority at the House of Representatives and the midterm elections are in November 2nd, 2021. So those are very close. It's very unlikely that there's going to be a big push to, to really shift uh, tax uh, structures materially ahead of this election. So we tend to agree with that view. Now, um, as we said at the, at the beginning of the episode, we spent a lot of time talking about inflationary pressures. But today we wanted to spend a minute to talk about the D word, deflation. Um, there are quite a few deflationary pressures that can play out in the economy. And as an example, we wanted to show you uh, the following graph. So as you can see from the, from the graph behind you, uh, there, the, what, what we're trying to illustrate with this is, is what's called in, uh, innovation-driven deflation. So innovation-driven deflation occurs when production costs decrease due to productivity or technology gains. This is a type of deflation that has made TVs and computers cheaper and higher quality over time. It is also the same type of deflation that is driving down the costs of battery packs and electric vehicles in general. Now, what does this do? This type of deflation creates another type of deflation, which is called disruption-based deflation. So again, on the back of your screen, you have the share of uh, vehicle sales by fuel type. And as you can see, electric vehicles have essentially picking up, are picking up steam and it's only accelerating. What that causes is disruption-based deflationary pressure. So those are caused by the industries that are being disrupted. So this would be the 
traditional fuel or combustion engine type of uh, competitors that are trying to compete against these electric vehicles that are getting increasingly cheaper. And uh, as an example, these companies that are selling these combustion engine vehicles will be forced to lower their prices to compete with these cost-effective electric vehicles. That puts overall downward pressure on prices in general. Um, now, uh, let's bring it back uh, to not the graph. Right. So these, these forces are always at play in the economy, and they push back against this inflationary by design fiat currency. Uh, Kathy Wood from ARK Invest also sees a potential third source of deflation in commodities next year, and this is excess inventory. This may actually kick in towards the end of this year as she fears that manufacturers today and suppliers are double or triple ordering now to meet strong demand forecasts. But she fears that these sort of demand forecasts or these suppliers and producers will be actually stuck with way too much inventory, uh, which will actually lead to, to more deflationary pressures in the future. So uh, we've covered a lot today and we have a big week coming up. Um, if you uh, have any comments or if you have any questions, anything you'd like us to add in the next issue, we welcome you to drop your comments in the section below and uh, we'll be more than happy to answer your questions and try to incorporate uh, your, your uh, requests into our next uh, issue. Um, if you learned something today, if you enjoyed the show, I welcome you to subscribe to our channel, like it below and uh, share it with your friends. If you don't yet have a Ledin account, I welcome you to check out Ledin.io and learn how you can start earning 12.5% on your USDC or 6.1% on your first two Bitcoin. We also have Bitcoin back loans and our B2X loans to double the Bitcoin with, uh, with one of our loans. So thank you so much. Have a great week, everybody, and see you next time.